today I want to minister on the last days out of Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. So I was having a conversation with my good friend, uh, Ernie Toppin, and uh, we started talking about uh, his music and different things. And so when I hung up the phone, I put his song on five more minutes and then the song Judgment Day. And while I was listening to the song Judgment Day, God dropped this sermon on me. And I knew immediately that God wanted me to minister on this topic today. I was uh, thinking about a few years back, my middle son, probably about 25 years old at the time. Uh, he's not saved, and so he lives uh, in his own apartment. He had a friend over, and they were drinking one night. And he said he drank so much that he blacked out. And next thing you know, he wakes up in the middle of the night, and he looks to the side, and he notices that his friend's not there anymore. And the only thing that is there is just his shoes um, and his pants and his clothes was uh, kind of uh, nicely put on top of the shoes. And so he freaks out. My son being raised in church immediately thought the rapture had happened. Now, his friend was drinking uh, and partying also. I'm not sure why he thought his friend would have gotten raptured. But he starts to panic. He's looking throughout the house, throughout the apartment. He's, uh, he's calling out his name. Um, he's not responding. He goes outside. Um, his friend's car is there, um, uh, but uh, his friend cannot be found. Um, and so he comes to the conclusion that his friend uh, had gotten raptured, uh, and uh, he said that he was terrified. And I thought about that because, you know what, that's uh, true for a lot of people today. A lot of people that are terrified because they're not sure if they're going to make heaven their home. A lot of people are not ready. If the rapture were to happen today, they would not be ready to make heaven their home. So I want to preach out of Matthew 25, verse 31. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates um, or divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left hand. Then uh, the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed uh, of my father, inherit the kingdom uh, prepared for you. From the foundation of the world, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, uh, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to see me. Then the righteous will answer to him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked uh, and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison um, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Verse 41, then he will also say to those on the left, depart from me. You cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison um, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. I want to preach a sermon uh, today that I've entitled Judgment Day. And let's look at, first of all, the second coming of Jesus Christ or the great separation. 
In verse 31, um, Jesus said um, that all the nations will be gathered um, before him uh, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. When Jesus came the first time, he came to unite us. When he came the first time, he came with one goal in mind uh, and that was to unite us all through his salvation. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe it in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That when he came, amen, he came to, to save us all, to, to unite the entire world. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Um, Jesus says, um, I don't want anybody to perish. I want every single person, every single soul to make it to heaven with me. When he came the first time, beloved, uh, he came to unite us. Uh, but when he comes the second time, uh, he's coming to divide us. Verse 3, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd... Divides his sheep from the goats. In chapter 24, this is uh, the chapter before our text. The disciples asked them, how will we know when your second coming is? And he gives them uh, signs. And, and then he tells them, um, nobody knows of the hour. Not even uh, the angels in heaven and not even me. Now why would he not tell them or tell us? The reason is simple, because he knows human nature. He knows that if we knew the exact hour or the exact minute that he was coming back for his church, um, we would wait until that minute uh, and then get saved and get right with him. So what he tells him instead is that you should always be prepared. Because uh, I'm coming um, as a thief in the night, uh, in a blink of an eye. In other words, um, there is no warning um, to that moment. Um, I'm asking you to always be ready. The first parable that he gives us. In chapter 25. He ends up giving the disciples three different parables. Every single parable has to do with the very last hour before he comes. The first parable is about the ten virgins. And in verse 1. He says then. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. We know that the foolish did not make it in. We know that he closed the, the door. The Bible says that he shut the door on them um, and that he told them to depart from them. He gives the disciples um, this parable about five foolish virgins uh, and five um, wise virgins and he mentions a lamp he says all 10 of them were carrying this lamp he says the difference is that the wise had their lamps filled with oil and the foolish didn't and the parable is simple the parable is about salvation um, and it's about staying saved um, it's not once saved always saved um, you can run out of oil. You can backslide. Um, the parable is about making sure um, that when Jesus Christ comes back the second time, um, that you are saved. And the difference between the wise and the foolish was that the wise had their lamps filled, but the foolish did not. In other words, um, the foolish were carrying a lamp, um, but they were just using it as a front See, to be wise or to be a wise virgin means that your love and your energy and your affection all goes to the one um, that you are saving yourself for. And uh, because you're saving yourself for that person, you completely devote your entire life to that person. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest 
commandment. To be wise means that you have a genuine fear for the Lord. And therefore, because you have this reverence towards him, um, you do everything within your power uh, to make sure uh, that your relationship is always right with your heavenly father. Proverbs 9.10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge um, of the Holy One is understanding. Not fear in the sense of where you're walking around every day wondering if he's going to squash you like a little bug. Um, but the word there is reverence. In other words, you have respect for your relationship for him. And because of it, you consider um, the consequences um, if you were to damage that relationship or you... Uh, count the cost and your losses. Um, and at the end of the day, you realize that, that you're going to lose more than you're going to gain by sinning. And therefore, you continue to be faithful. Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life um, to turn one away from the snares of death. But then we have the foolish virgins. And we know that their lamps don't have any oil. Or the picture there is a Christian with no substance. Or not a Christian, but a person, amen, with no substance. Um, in other words, they look like a Christian on the outside, but on the inside, um, there's no substance. The lamp is a show. Listen, just because you carry a lamp doesn't mean that you have oil. These are the religious people that Jesus was addressing in his days. In Matthew 23, verse 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, um, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Paul put it this way. The apostle Paul said in the last days, um, one of the signs um, of uh, the coming of Christ is going to be that uh, there are going to be people that are going to have a form of of religion or a form of God's power. Uh, but the reality is that they are imposters. 2 Timothy 3, 5. Paul said, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. That word form in that scripture is the word morpho. It's where we get the, the word morphosis from. It means to form or to have the appearance of something. Um, and what Paul was saying uh, is that uh, the religious people, uh, they have an appearance, uh, but uh, they're not going to have the power in the last days. The lamp, uh, but no oil. See, but metamorphosis is true salvation. It means to be transformed. Um, the word meta means to change after Following a new pattern is what it means. Um, in other words, uh, since the day you got saved, um, your life has never been the same. See, religious people can't say that. You ask a religious person, when did you get saved? And they'll say, oh, well, I got baptized when I was a baby. That's not salvation. Salvation um, is repenting and knowing what you are repenting of um, and inviting Jesus Christ in your heart. Uh, and from that moment forward, uh, your entire life changes. In other words, you're able to say, I used to be a drunk, uh, but I no longer drink alcohol. I used to smoke marijuana, but I no longer smoke marijuana. I used to sleep around and fornicate, um, but now uh, I'm saving myself for marriage. See, June 11, 1995 is the day that I got radically saved and converted. And I can tell you that that was the last day that I touched drugs, that I touched alcohol that I ever went back to that street life. See, this is what separates the wise from the foolish or the genuine from the fake or the loyalist um, from the imposters or the imitators or the hypocrites. See, this is true also for churches and the church world today. The religious church world today, the, the cool and prosperity preaching churches will be divided from his real and true church when he returns. In reality, um, they are the greatest fools. The foolish had lamps, but no oil. In other words, they talked the talk, but they did not walk the walk. Doesn't that sound like today's religious prosperity churches? 
These are the churches and Christians that practice hypocrisy. Matthew 23, verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones uh, and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside uh, you are full of hypocr uh, hypocrisy uh, and lawlessness. Jesus says the outside looks good. You look religious. You're, you look the part, but the problem is the inside. The problem is that you leave church and then you go right back to your old ways. And he says that is hypocrisy. That means uh, the practice of claiming to have moral standards or beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform. In other words, um, you're looking at a person that calls himself a Christian, um, but the way that they live uh, does not match to a Christian life. So let's look at secondly, the stewards and his talents. Let's look at giving an account for what we have been entrusted with. This is the second parable that Jesus uses to explain the last hour before he comes. In verse 29 of uh, Matthew 25, it says, For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant um, into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We are familiar with this scripture. We know that uh, the master gave uh, his servants talents. He gave one talent. Uh, he gave the other one two talents. And the other one three talents or five talents. Um, and um, he went away for a long time. And when he came back, the one that had one talent had buried in the ground. He did nothing. He brought no return to his master. Therefore, his master said, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. See, the second parable that our Lord Jesus Christ shared has to do with what we do after salvation. In other words, it's not enough to just be saved, but he expects a return. Here's the thing. It's he's talking about judgment. He's talking about giving an account. Um, the reality is that no one likes to think about judgment or these things. But there's going to be a day in all of our futures, and I'm speaking to the saved right now, when every Christian will give an account for his stewardship or lack of. That means from the day that you got saved uh, until the day that you die or you get raptured. Um, from that moment to that moment, uh, you are going to give an account. We are going to give an account for what we did after salvation. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. This in 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That we're going to have to give an account for what we did or did not do with the talents and the gifts and the responsibilities that our Lord and Savior gave to us after salvation. In our text in verse 19, the King, King James Version says it this way, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and reckoned with them. Jesus, listen to me, is coming soon. And just like this Lord reckoned with his servants, um, Jesus is going to reckon also with his saints. The definition of reckon, it comes from the Greek word uh, sunari, logan meta. It is a, a commercial term uh, that uh, means to compare accounts. It is also a bookkeeping phrase um, that means to look at the records or to open the books or to study the facts um, or to settle accounts. It means um, that he is going to look at what we have done um, and compare it to what he asked us to do. 
that the day that we stand before Jesus Christ, the books are going to be open. And he's not going to look at all of our good deeds. What he's going to want to know is, did you do the things that I asked you to do? Revelations 20, 12 tells us that there are all kinds of records and books in heaven. One of them is called the book of life. It says, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things um, which were written in the books according to their works. The scripture also says um, that there are books, that's plural, that are going to be open, containing records uh, of what we did uh, and did not do on the earth. Now, I'm not sure everything that's in those books, but I do know this. Jesus must take that pretty seriously. If he's saving them, and there is a, a place where he's keeping these books to open the day that we stand before him. He's going to want to know what he did, what we did with what he entrusted us with. It's important to note this. This in judgment would not be in regard to our salvation. Obviously, if we're standing before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. It means we made it to heaven. Uh, but this is a, a different kind of judgment. This is giving an account for our stewardship. And uh, he says it's going to determine your reward. You know, it's interesting. But Paul says, the apostle Paul says that there are, there are those who are saved or will be saved, but they will have no reward. 1 Corinthians 3, 14, if anyone work or if anyone's work, which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, uh, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, uh, yet so as through fire. Paul says there are going to be those Christians um, that came to church um, and they buried uh, their talents. Um, they're going to stand before Jesus Christ one day and there's going to be no reward. Why? Because Jesus expects us to do something with the gifts and the talents and the abilities and, and the assignments that he has entrusted us with. Therefore, we must do everything we can within our power to please Jesus and to be a wise steward. Now, maybe before this quarantine, you weren't uh, doing what God has asked you to do. Maybe you, you buried your talent in the ground. Maybe you took your hands off of the plow. Can I tell you that there is no better time than right now to put your hands back on the plow? Um, we're living in the last hour. Jesus Christ is coming back anytime. Um, and uh, there's no better time than right now than to start to get serious. For Jesus Christ. Why? Because a day of reckoning is coming. Not just for the world. But for his saints. So let's close. Let's close with the judgment. Let's look at how there's only two sides. There's heaven or hell. There's sheeps or goats. Those are the only two options. That Jesus Christ gives us. Verse 31 when the Son of Man comes in his holy, in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, uh, and he will separate them one from another, um, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Uh, and he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And we know that the those that were righteous and did what he asked them to do, that he said. Welcome into uh, everlasting uh, uh, happiness and joy. Amen. But the ones on the left, uh, he said, depart from me into everlasting torment. Now, Jesus is being pretty clear and simple here. And what he's saying is that the way that determines whether you are a sheep or a goat, or, or whether you're going to heaven or you're going to hell, um, is... Uh, by what you are doing, amen, with what 
our Heavenly Father has asked of you. Only those that are doing the will of the Father is what he's saying. Verse 33, in our text, amen, it says, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. In other words, he says, listen, I, I needed clothes. I, I was in prison. I was, I was in need, and, and you never visited me. And he says, depart from me now. In other words, the only way you can identify yourself with Jesus Christ is if you are doing the will of God. What he's saying to these disciples is you cannot identify yourself with me if you're doing your own thing and serving me on your own terms. Then he shall also say unto them on his left hand, which is the goats, or the foolish virgins, or the slothful and wicked servants. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. See, it doesn't take a genius to understand that right now, judgment is in the air. Even sinners are, are sensing that things aren't right right now. They're, they're starting to look at the scriptures. They're starting to view online. And yet people are more afraid today of a, of a virus than they are of God's judgment. People are more careful about catching a virus than they are about catching sin and going to hell. How I many know people ought to be running to God right now? The end is near. Right now is not a time to play games. Judgment is coming. Verse 37 in uh, chapter 24 of Matthew, it says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, um, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, uh, until the day that Noah entered the ark um, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, it's crazy, but people seem to be clueless right now to what's happening in the spiritual uh, world. It seems like people aren't getting it right now. Or maybe they just don't want to accept it. People are more concerned with, with getting back to work um, so that they can make more money and not lose their earthly possessions and not even worried about losing their soul. The streets are empty right now. It feels eerie. You can look at states like Louisiana and New York and, and where there once used to be people where it was flooded with people enjoying their sins. Uh, now are completely empty. One virus has brought the entire world to its knees and yet people aren't concerned. This is a time for the church to wake up. This is a time for the servant to begin to put his hands to the plow. It's a time for the world to repent because judgment day is coming. This isn't the, the end. But Jesus says, when you start to see all these things, it's the beginning of many sorrows. It's definitely not the end. We're going to get past this, but we're also going to start to see things get out of control. We're going to start to see weather out of control. We're going to start to see nations come against each other. Why? Because God is not just going to keep allowing wickedness in the world. A judgment is coming against the wicked. He's not going to just sit back and keep watching child pornography uh, and uh, human trafficking uh, and Mardi Gras um, and the slaughtering of millions of babies every year. His patience has run out. His grace is running out. I recently read this article 
10 plagues that are hitting our planet simultaneously and no one's talking about. The first one is about the armies of locusts, swarms of locusts, the size of, of major cities have been devouring entire farms in Africa in as little as 30 seconds. These swarms of locusts are the, uh, the size um, of a big city. They said some of these swarms were as big as New York City. Talks about extreme, bizarre weather patterns, floods, and record-breaking winds that are uh, tearing up cities and nations uh, throughout the world. He mentioned uh, Australia and, uh, and the fires that burned for months. Man could not stop them. You know what put out the Australian fires? Heavy doses uh, of rain. Fire consumes the eastern part of Australia. And then God sends rain from heaven and puts it out. Talks about unprecedented floodings. Entire cities that are under 18 feet of water. Hurricanes. Tsunamis. Talks about major earthquakes that are happening all over the world. Just um, last week, there was one in El Paso. I believe one of the first, um, a 5.0. The day before yesterday, we had one in Idaho, a 6.5, the biggest in over 40 years. And here we are now sitting with the coronavirus quarantine. The entire world has come to a stop. Matthew 24, verse 6 says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Like I said, it's not the end. But what he is saying it's when you start to see all these things. If you are living in these days, which all these things are taking place right now. He says, watch. Because I'm going to come as a thief in the night. He says, that's the last hour. So my question to you this evening is, if Jesus Christ were to come back tonight, or if Jesus Christ were to come back right now, if today was judgment day, would you be ready? Breaking news. We are receiving reports that millions of people have vanished. The total number of people missing has not yet been confirmed. It is expected to be a lot higher than what was initially reported. This has been stated as the worst disaster in human history. Many parents are in complete despair as their children have also disappeared. Many planes have crashed due to pilots disappearing in mid-flight. Many roads are blocked with accidents. Hospitals have not been able to- What happened? Where am I? All I remember was seeing my husband disappear while he was driving, and <gasps> the rapture happened. I, I tried to move the car from oncoming traffic, but but it was too late. I must have died in that wreck. A and now I'm here. Now is the time to be judged for your time spent on Earth, for today is Judgment Day. I made it! This is it! Heaven! I made it to heaven! Now let the books be open and see if your name is found in the Lamb's Book of Life. Anyone whose name is not found in the book will be thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus! I know my name is in there. I've been ready for this moment. I went to church, I prayed, I witnessed, I led many to you, Lord. Indeed, although you honored me with your lips, your heart was far from me. Your name is not found in the book. Depart from me. 
I do not know you. No, Lord, no! Let me into heaven. Give me another chance. Cast this unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where am I? What is this place? All I remember was being in church, talking to a brother, and the next thing I know, I'm here. Now is the time to be judged for your time spent on earth. For today is judgment day. Jesus, it's you. Now let the books be opened and see if your name is found in the Lamb's Book of Life. Anyone whose name is not found in the book will be thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus, I'm not worthy to step into heaven. I've done so much bad in my life. I was so broken and hopeless. And when someone told me that you can wash me of my sins and give me a new life, I knew I needed you in my heart. Because you've confessed me before men, I will confess you before my Father. Well done good and faithful servant, you may enter into heaven. What if what you just saw in this video was real? What if Judgment Day was happening tonight? And you were standing before Jesus Christ. Would you be ready to give an account? See, my friend, Jesus Christ said that he wishes that none would perish. He came and he died so that everybody can make it to heaven. But you can't just act religious and think that somehow you're gonna just somehow slip into heaven. Jesus says you must be ready, you must have oil. Tonight, I'm not sure if your heart is right with Jesus Christ. Maybe you're out there, you're live streaming this. And you want to get right. You want to make heaven your home. My friend, I want you to make heaven your home. And Jesus definitely wants you to make heaven your home. If you're ready to repent of your sins and receive Jesus Christ in your heart as your Lord and Savior. And I want you to do one thing for me tonight. I want you to bow your head right there where you're at. And I want you to close your eyes. I want you to re repeat this prayer after me. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I repent of all of my sins and I thank you that you died on the cross for me and I thank you that, that you rose on the third day and I receive you in my heart as my Lord and my Savior thank you for giving me a way to make heaven my home amen I said that prayer almost 25 years ago this June 11 in 2020 is going to be 25 years that I've been saved I want to challenge you I want to challenge you to begin to live for Jesus Christ and maybe you are a saint who is not engaged anymore and since this quarantine maybe even this message has stirred you to once again be on fire I want to encourage you to do that once the doors open from the church, plug yourself back in, get involved, and serve the, le the Lord Jesus Christ, because the day of reckoning is coming. God bless you.